I'm Karen Kuntz, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Lucy Turcott. She's um, a pediatrician in the Heme Onc department. She has an MPH in maternal and child health and an MD from here. She did her residency in Seattle and her uh, fellowship here at the Children's Hospital. Um, her research is studying, is focused on second malignancies and short and long term outcomes in pediatric cancer survivors. She was just awarded a KO8 to study subsequent breast cancer treatment and outcomes among childhood cancer survivors. Today, she's going to talk about second cancers in the childhood cancer survivor, and two is not better than one. Welcome. All right, thanks so much for having me today, and uh, make sure this works. So I have nothing to disclose. There's not a lot of money in um, pediatric cancer epidemiology. So today I want to talk a little bit about pediatric cancer in general, how it's treated, the evolution over time, since I think most of the people here are probably not pediatric uh, oncologists or researchers. And then I want to talk a little bit about the late effects of pediatric treatments and highlight subsequent cancer risk factors. I'm also going to describe subsequent cancers in the more recent treatment eras and how we've seen evolution over time, and then discuss future directions and late effects research. So this is, I thought, kind of a fun, interesting article. So in 1948, Sidney Farber published for the first time the ability to induce remission in childhood ALL. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it was a pretty huge deal. He used single-agent aminopterin, which is a folic acid antagonist, and although the remissions didn't last, this was a really exciting time. Uh, before this, children had universally died from a new diagnosis of leukemia. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of how treatment with pediatric cancer has evolved over time, and I'm not going to go through all of the details, but highlight a few of the things. You can see here, first piece is really in 1948, and that was just what I described from Sidney Farber's article, the first use of antifolate agents to treat ALL. And quickly after that, recognizing that, in, uh, that um, remission could be induced but didn't last with single agent, the first clinical trials of multi-agent chemotherapy and ALL, uh, including steroids, methotrexate, and 6-MP, were introduced in the early 1950s. It was quickly recognized that with these rare diseases, you couldn't do a whole lot at a single center, and that led to the cooperative group formation to help research and study childhood cancer treatments. Treatments evolved over time, and we were able to do better and better at inducing and maintaining remission, but it wasn't until the 1970s that there were two publications in 1971 and then in 1972 that speculated that cure might actually be possible in pediatric cancer. People were actually a little bit upset about these publications and felt like they were giving people false hope, um, but it was, I think, really the introduction to the success we've had. You can see here, by 1990, cure rates in ALL specifically exceeded 80%, um, cure rates that are seen in very few adulthood malignancies. And because of that, and because we were curing more children with cancer, we were beginning to recognize that these children were experiencing a lot of long-term health complications or health consequences of the therapy that they were receiving. And it was because of that that the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study was established here at the University of Minnesota in the mid-1990s. The intention of that study was to study uh, children who had been treated for cancer and were long-term survivors and to track them over time to understand what health complications they were facing and then to get a better understanding of what the risk factors were for these. You can see since that time there have been a number of other great uh, accomplishments and um, the overall outcomes in pediatric cancers are now quite good. Just to give you, again, an idea of what survival has done over the course of the last uh, 50 to 60 years, before 1960, you can see here, and using ALL as an example, no matter what was tried, eventually all of these lines went down to zero. But after 1960, with these multi-agent chemotherapies, you can see that with each subsequent clinical trial, outcomes have improved dramatically, such that in the mid-2000s, we were curing more than 90% of children with ALL. 
all this is really the result of multimodal therapy. And so multiple types of chemotherapies combined, the additions of things like immunotherapy, surgery, and radiation therapy have all combined to uh, lead to these superb outcomes. And when you look at overall survival in childhood cancer on the left-hand side, um, when you look at all types of cancers combined and not just ALL, we're now curing more than 80% of children. However, in 2015, with an estimated 429,000 survivors of childhood cancer in the U.S. and an estimated uh, or an expectation of half a million by 2020, uh, we've seen that more than two-thirds of childhood cancer survivors are developing severe and chronic uh, health complications of their therapy. And we believe that these complications are largely due to their previous treatments. What are the different types of late effects or long-term health complications? What we found is they can affect pretty much any organ system in the body. So we're seeing pulmonary, endocrine, cardiovascular, neurologic, psychologic, developmental, and then uh, secondary cancers, which is going to be the focus of our talk today. I think this is a striking uh, image that was published in 2008. And Looking at late mortality after five-year cancer survival, so looking at the x-axis, you can see that's years since diagnosis, and then on the y-axis, that's the survival function estimate. And the top two lines are the general population of U.S. females and males matched in age, and then the steeper slopes are females and males who survived childhood cancer. And although the y-axis is a little bit deceiving that it's only going down to 80%, you can see there's a dramatic discrepancy between survivors of childhood cancer compared to the general population. And when we look at the underlying reasons for the increased rates of mortality among this population, we see that recurrence or progression, which is that top steep curve, is the most common reason for individuals to pass away. But secondary malignancies are an important cause of mortality as well. And you can see that starting around 20 years after diagnosis, that um, slope really begins to accelerate, whereas the slope for the recurrence or progression begins to uh, slow down. As I mentioned, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study was established in the mid-1990s in an effort to better understand late, second, uh, late effects as well as secondary cancers and survivors of childhood cancer. We looked at five-year survivors who were diagnosed with the most common types of pediatric malignancies between the years of 1970 and 1986. Individuals were diagnosed at less than 21 years of age, and one of the things that makes this cohort so powerful is that it collected detailed treatment data on all of the individuals that were enrolled. And it also followed up with these individuals periodically over time so that they could self-report any long-term health complications that they were experiencing. We specifically, for the purpose of secondary cancers, have validated all of those um, over the course of time, and we update them every few years so that they're current. And for this initial population, we believe that the 14,000 participants made up about 20% of childhood cancer survivors in the U.S. during the study period. So as you can see, this is just another repeat of the curves I showed previously, but just pointing out that for secondary cancers, the rate of uh, mortality related to secondary cancers exceeds that of recurrence at about 20 years post-diagnosis. To give you an idea of what these secondary cancers can look like, we see rather benign subsequent neoplasms like non-melanoma skin cancers, which we put into one category. We see another group of uh, secondary neoplasms called benign meningiomas. They're considered benign in terms of their sort of behavior, but they can be actually quite uh, aggressive in terms of space-occupying lesions in the central nervous system, often related to radiation. The focus for today is going to be on these malignant neoplasms here, so thyroid cancers, soft tissue sarcomas, and breast cancers, as well as others. And what you can see is that looking at years from initial cancer diagnosis, this top line is all of those different types of subsequent neoplasms grouped together. And you can see, <coughs> excuse me, that that line just continues to climb. So there's not any slowing in the rate of increase for the cumulative incidence from 
up to 30 years from initial diagnosis. And then we look at each of these individual types, the non-melanoma skin cancers, subsequent neoplasms, or subsequent malignant neoplasms, and meningiomas. We look at those according to radiation exposure. You can see that those individuals who had this RT, or radiation, were experiencing higher rates of cancers over time. So specifically in the subsequent malignancy category, radiation, uh, about 10% of individuals uh, by 30 years out from diagnosis were experiencing a second cancer if they'd had radiation. To give you an idea of the different types of childhood cancer and which individuals were at the greatest risk, you can see here, here are the different types of childhood cancers, so Hodgkin's, soft tissue sarcomas, and so forth. And then we looked at the observed number of subsequent malignancies, and that's compared then to the expected number based on SEER population data. And with those numbers, we were able to calculate a standardized incidence ratio, or SIR, and that gives you an idea of their risk compared to the general population. So you can see that overall, survivors are at about a six-fold increased risk for developing a secondary cancer. And the groups that are at the highest risk compared to the general population are individuals who had Hodgkin lymphoma, so individuals who had likely high doses of uh, mantle field radiation therapy, individuals who have CNS tumors, neuroblastomas. And then the types of second cancers that we're seeing most frequently are <laughs> cancers of the central nervous system, breast, thyroid, and bone. So I'll highlight just a few of the specific uh, subsequent malignancy reports that came out um, with this initial CCSS data set. I think breast cancer, since it is one of the most frequently observed second malignancies, is particularly interesting. And I'm not sure how well you can see this, but this is looking at risk by radiation exposure. And so you can see here this blue hash line is showing a nice dose response curve. So dose of radiation to the breast tissue, and then odds ratio of developing a secondary breast cancer. So very clear cut dose response. Then we also looked at whether or not individuals had received ovarian radiation exposure. So this yellow line shows odds ratios for individuals who'd received ovarian radiation at less than five gray. So it had probably preserved hormonal function after that. Their risk was higher, whereas individuals who'd received radiation exposure at greater than five gray to the ovaries had a much lower risk. So very interesting. I think this is also particularly interesting. So this is a cumulative uh, risk curves of individuals based on attained age. It shows here individuals with Hodgkin lymphoma who received chest radiation, other childhood cancers with the yellow line who received chest radiation, compares them to BRCA1 and 2 carriers and also to the SEER benchmark data. And what you can see here is that individuals who'd had Hodgkin lymphoma and been treated with radiation were experiencing breast cancers at the same rate as individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. I think that's a really striking curve to, uh, that most people aren't necessarily aware of. We also found that, breast, that uh, women who were not exposed to radiation were still at increased risk of breast cancer based on chemotherapy exposures. So you can see here, when we looked at women who developed breast cancer not exposed to radiation, high doses of alkylating agents, shown here as cyclophosphamide equivalent doses, and high doses of anthracycline exposure were at increased risk for developing breast cancer. Highlight a little bit on thyroid cancer as well, since these curves are fairly interesting. You can see here the light blue line shows individuals who were diagnosed with their childhood cancer at less than 10 years of age. The dark blue line here shows individuals diagnosed at uh, 10 years or older. And what you can see here is with the relative risk then dose of radiation exposure, up to about 20 gray, the dose or the risk increases rather precipitously. It's frozen, but what you can see is as the uh, line doesn't show anything. There we go. So what you can see here is um, what was presumed to be a cell-killing effect. So with higher doses of radiation to the neck, um, 
presuming that that actually then the risk goes back down because of a cell killing effect. Central nervous system tumors, we're seeing a similar uh, dose-response relationship. So dose in gray here on the x-axis, relative risk. These open boxes are um, relative risk of developing meningioma, so those more benign considered brain tumors. And then the dark boxes here are risk of gliomas. You can see relative, uh, you know, steeper slope for the meningi meningiomas, but a nice dose response that we can see for both types. So, important conclusions from some of these early studies that subsequent malignancy incidence doesn't plateau even at 30 years following childhood cancer diagnosis. And that therapeutic radiation is an important risk factor for multiple types of subsequent cancers. Solid tumors of the breast, bone, thyroid, and central nervous system are the most frequently observed of second malignancies. So I don't know if any of you have spent any time in Memphis, but during my fellowship, I did. Um, so the CCSS transferred from the University of Minnesota to um, the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital several years ago. And during my fellowship, I wanted to get involved in survivorship research. So I spent several weeks at St. Jude. And this was the old Memphis Grizzlies basketball stadium, apparently, which is right across from the hospital and was my view. And my job with the CCSS was to review all of the second cancer data. So every single subsequent malignancy that was part of the cohort, I validated and reviewed, all while staring at this beautiful pyramid. And the intent with that was then to be able to present data on what happened as these survivors aged. So never before have we been able to describe aging survivors because they didn't exist. So now that survivors were reaching the fifth and sixth decades of life, we wanted to understand what happened to them. Do their risks ever go away as they age? Do they return to the normal baseline population levels as they get further out from their exposures? So we had just over 3,100 individuals who had completed at least one study questionnaire after the age of 40. We looked at whether or not they'd had malignancies before age 40. We looked at their radiation exposure as well. Within this population, you can see that individuals with Hodgkin lymphoma are probably overrepresented just because that's a malignancy of adolescence and young adulthood and also very curable. So we see a larger proportion than expected in a general childhood cancer population of Hodgkin survivors. And then our malignancies like Wilms tumor and neuroblastoma, which are cancers of very young childhood, are relatively underrepresented just because those individuals hadn't had the chance to age into the, this group yet. So what we saw was that subsequent malignancies, you know, we had 196 in 180 individuals that occurred after age 40. Uh, the types of malignancies we were seeing in the individuals after age 40 were very similar to what we were seeing prior to age 40. So cancers of the breast, soft tissue sarcomas, thyroid, very typical to our previous reports. And what we also saw was that cumulative incidence continued to climb with increasing age. So using this time attained age as the uh, time scale on the x-axis, starting at age 40, you can see that any type of subsequent neoplasm by age 55, almost 35% had developed some type of subsequent neoplasm. And when we look specifically at malignancies or secondary cancers, about 16% had developed some type of second cancer. We then looked, this is busy and mostly just showing you the effect of radiation, but you can see here in individuals who did not receive therapeutic radiation, in the gray line they're showing individuals who did have some type of subsequent neoplasm before age 40. The red lines are showing individuals who had no subsequent neoplasm before age 40. You can see about 10% of them were developing some type of secondary cancer. When we looked at radiation exposure and we saw that by age 55, that number was closer to about 20% were developing a subsequent malignancy. So radiation is still having a very important effect even by the time people were reaching age 55. And you can imagine in some of these individuals, they'd been exposed years and years and years before to radiation therapy. Then the question is, the general population is getting more malignancies as they age. So 
all 55 year olds are at higher risk for cancer. Um, how does this population compare to the general population? So we again looked at standardized incidence ratios. So the observed number of cancers compared to what's expected. And what we saw was that within our population, risk of developing any type of subsequent malignancy was about fourfold higher compared to the general population. The specific types of subsequent malignancies that we were seeing at the individuals being at the greatest risk for were cancers of the breast, kidney, soft tissue sarcoma, and thyroid. Again, probably some overrepresentation of breast cancers here because of the number of Hodgkin survivors included in this population and the high use of radiation to the chest in that population. So some of the conclusions for aging survivors is that cumulative incidence of subsequent neoplasms continues to climb with increasing age. Risk for malignancy remains elevated compared to the general population, and that lack of cancer before age 40, or lack of a subsequent cancer before age 40, was not protective from developing one after age 40. And therapeutic radiation remains an important risk factor, even many years after exposure. So all these results were very interesting, but people started to ask very relevant questions. Well, what about people who are treated in more current treatment eras? How do these results apply to them? What's happened as we've learned this information about late effects? So, yeah. Um, yes, there were. So, colon cancer, yeah. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. The question was whether there are some other cancers that are common that were not increased by colon. Yeah, so in terms of the, what, the types of subsequent malignancies that were not increased, we did see increase minimally for breast and colon cancers. Uh, we didn't see much increase for things like head and neck cancers. And that's, uh, I think really that's just the general population rates then starting to catch up. So by that time point, many other people are developing head and neck cancers and our group just doesn't seem to be at increased risk compared to them. But yeah, you're right, there's definitely certain subsequent cancers that they're not experiencing at greater rates. So in 2016, the CCSS cohort was expanded to include about 10,000 additional survivors, now including individuals treated from 1987 to 1999 with the idea that this would enhance our ability to address effects of treatment changes over time. The first paper to come out from this data was uh, published in the New England Journal in 2016 and showed a really remarkable decrease in late mortality by treatment era. So you can see here, this blue line shows the mortality curve for individuals treated in the 1970s, the red line for those treated in the 1980s, and the green line for those treated in the 1990s. And we see a significant decrease at 15 year cumulative mortality based on decade of treatment. And we look at different causes for mortality over time, and you can see here that death from any cause has decreased, death from recurrence or progression, and then for my interest and purposes, death from subsequent neoplasms has also decreased over time. And then the question becomes, are the deaths decreasing because people are experiencing fewer subsequent cancers, or are they decreasing because we're doing a better job of managing those second cancers? So that led to my first study using the uh, expanded cohort data, looking at temporal trends in treatment and also in subsequent neoplasm risk. And so, now, when I went down most recently to, uh, to St. Jude, they've turned that large uh, pyramid into a large Bass Pro Shop. So expanded improved cohort, expanded improved pyramid. Um, we saw that the new and updated cohort included uh, about 23,600 individuals, saw fairly similar, similar distributions of diseases across decades. But what was interesting when we looked at therapeutic exposures, and probably not overly surprising, is that um, here you can see this kind of teal line shows radiation exposure. So it's showing the proportion of individuals exposed, such that in the 1970s, about 80% of the survivors were exposed to radiation as part of their therapy, whereas in the 1990s, that number had decreased to 40%. 
black line shows alkylating agent chemotherapy exposure, so 40% exposed in the 1970s, up to about 60% in the 1990s, and then epipedophilotoxin therapy, essentially known receiving it in the 70s, up to about 30% in the 1990s. So you can see the trade-off as we decrease the intensity of radiation is to increase the intensity of chemotherapy. You can see here the cumulative dosage exposure of alkylating agents, shown here with these dark blue lines, used to really blast people with huge doses. And that's actually decreased, so even though the number of people exposed is increasing, the cumulative dosing has decreased over time. And then epipedophilotoxins initially increase and then decrease. So when we looked at cumulative incidence of subsequent malignancies, you can see the this uh, black line here shows individuals treated in the 1970s, red individuals from the 1980s, and the green individuals from the 1990s. And we did see a significant decrease in cumulative incidence with uh, the more recent treatment eras. Then wanted to understand when comparing individuals of similar ages, um, what the standardized incidence looked like across treatment eras. So you can see here on the x-axis, we have attained age, so 10 to 19, 20 to 29, and 30 to 39 years, and then standardized incidence ratios. And for individuals who have attained ages of 20 to 29 and 30 to 39, we did see a significant reduction in risk according to treatment decade. Then we need to understand what was driving that decrease in risk. And so our goal was to look at five-year treatment eras and see whether we could identify treatment risk factors that um, had decreased risk over time. So first looked at a multivariable model that was adjusted for sex, age at diagnosis, and attained age but not adjusted for treatment. And you can see the relative rates of subsequent neoplasms as an overall group subsequent malignancies specifically, meningiomas, and non-melanoma skin cancers all showed significant reductions over time. We then adjusted our model for treatments. So treatment adjustments included maximum radiation exposure, splenectomy, cyclophosphamide equivalent dose, anthracycline dose, epipedophilotoxin dose, platinums. And you can see that that risk or those relative rates were partially attenuated, suggesting a role for therapeutic changes over time in reduction of uh, subsequent neoplasm risk. We wanted to understand which of these therapies was specifically driving that risk reduction. So we next looked at each of them individually. And we were able to identify that when we specifically only adjusted for radiation in the model, we saw the greatest attenuation, suggesting that reduction in radiation over time was partially responsible for this reduction in subsequent neoplasm risk by treatment era. And this was a really important finding, and this was actually the first paper to demonstrate that decreased use of radiation over time has resulted in decreased rates of subsequent malignancies. It seems intuitive, but someone had to show it. So knowing that, and knowing that we continue to reduce our use of radiation over time, the question becomes, what happens to these individuals who aren't treated with radiation? What is their risk for developing second cancers? So we were able to look at this question in more detail and presented it at ASCO this year and currently have it submitted for publication. But we looked at uh, a population of about 7,500 individuals who were uh, treated with chemotherapy, but no radiation. And you can see here that there is a few differences compared to the overall CCSS cohort. So leukemia more uh, was represented uh, in a greater fashion here because many of those individuals don't receive radiation therapy. And then bone cancer patients also more highly represented in this group. Whereas individuals with brain tumors or Hodgkin lymphoma are underrepresented here because historically they've been uh, treated with radiation therapy. So that the overall chemotherapy exposures between this group and the overall cohort were quite similar, both in terms of the proportion receiving different types of chemotherapy as well as the cumulative dosing. So among these 7,448 survivors who were exposed to chemotherapy and no radiation, 
We identified 229 subsequent malignancies among 206 survivors. The most common types of subsequent malignancies included cancers of the breast and thyroid, melanomas, and soft tissue sarcomas. And what you see in the parentheses are the number of subsequent malignancies and then the number of survivors. So we had survivors who were experiencing multiple episodes of breast cancer as well as soft tissue sarcoma and thyroid cancer. We then wanted to compare what the cumulative incidence we haven't seen enough of these curves yet today, <laughs> of uh, subsequent malignancies looked like, or secondary malignancies looked like based on treatment. So you can see here that the red curve here represents individuals who are treated with chemotherapy and radiation. And their uh, cumulative incidence of a secondary malignancy by age 45 was nearly 14%. Killing me today. And then the blue line it shows that individuals who are treated with no chemotherapy but did receive radiation, they had a very similar cumulative incidence at age 45. And then we saw individuals in the green line who are treated with chemotherapy and no radiation. And the black line shows individuals who didn't receive chemotherapy or radiation. And although the cumulative incidence among the individuals who did not receive radiation was approximately half of what we were seeing in those who did receive radiation, we did see a significant difference between those individuals who received we did see a significant difference um, between the individuals who were treated with chemotherapy and no radiation and those who were treated with no chemotherapy and radiation, suggesting that there is an influence of the chemotherapy alone. Does anyone want to take this opportunity to ask a question? <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait for the microphone. Um, I don't know if these data are available, but how does this compare to adults who get radiation therapy for uh, malignancies? I'm thinking about ENT or um, uh, even breast cancer patients where they're yeah. primary tumors. That's a great breast. question. So in adults, they're certainly at the same level of risk for experiencing a subsequent malignancy. I think one of the reasons we don't hear about it as much, and probably it's not as widely published, is that um, a there's not necessarily this organized uh, cohort of them, but also the latency between exposure and developing that subsequent malignancy is often quite long. So we're seeing that for many of these subsequent malignancies, 10 to 20 years out, they're developing that secondary breast cancer, secondary colorectal cancer. And so in many of the adulthood malignancies when they're being exposed, they may die from other causes before they've had the opportunity to experience the second malignancy. So you can see here, Yes. Since we're on this topic, I mean, the difference between the difference between chemo, no radiation, and no chemo, no radiation is really small. It is really, really small. Really, really small. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, there are a lot of people. I guess it, you know, there are a lot of people who think that if you have a childhood cancer, that might be a risk factor for having a familial cancer syndrome, and a familial cancer syndrome yeah. might be. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. I think the this chemo this might data kind of uncover it. Yeah, this data just screams uh, genetic susceptibility. Absolutely, and so that's I'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. But that's certainly one of the next steps within this cohort is we've got GWAS data and whole exome sequencing that just wasn't available for this analysis. But to better understand among these individuals who's at risk because of their genetic susceptibility and who's at risk because of their chemotherapy exposure. And, uh, you know, this might not be a good way to get at it, but I'm wondering if one way to get at it would be to compare the risk of secondary malignancies in patients who get what we 
think of as a traditional oh, pediatric cancer. Oh, absolutely. So I'll, I'll show you that, those data in just a minute. It's like you were prepping for the next, uh, the next slide. So you can see here again, looking at standardized incidence ratios, when you look at all childhood cancers, individuals not exposed to radiation, the risk for developing a subsequent cancer is about threefold higher than the general population. And I think as Zohar is kind of mentioning, and we'll show with the subsequent few slides, the types of subsequent cancers that they're developing, things like leukemias, lymphomas, soft tissue sarcomas, are often malignancies that we would think of in the context of certain uh, cancer predisposition syndromes. So when we look at individuals with a history of leukemia and lymphoma, they're at an increased risk for developing uh, subsequent leukemias, lymphomas, breast cancers, uh, thyroid malignancies, and melanomas. Our Wilms tumor population, very interestingly, did not show an increased risk for developing any type of subsequent cancers. Neuroblastoma was at an overall increased risk for second malignancy. Our numbers were quite small, so we weren't necessarily able to show specific types of subsequent cancers that they were at risk for developing. And then our sarcoma, again, these would be individuals likely to have some type of cancer predisposition syndrome at risk for developing uh, breast cancers, soft tissue sarcomas, thyroid cancers. And then our CNS population, so uh, individuals not exposed to radiation who had a CNS tumor were at risk for developing subsequent cancers but not the types that we were seeing in the other groups. Very interestingly, these, were the these individuals were developing subsequent CNS tumors. So again, thinking about things like neurofibromatosis or other cancer predisposition syndromes. When we then looked at chemotherapy exposures to see if we could associate uh, dose intensities with subsequent malignancy risk, we did see that individuals who received high cumulative doses of alkylating agents as well as platinating agents we're at increased risk for developing subsequent malignancies. When we looked at specific subsequent malignancy types, so we looked at breast cancers, thyroid cancers, melanomas, leukemias, lymphomas, um, we found within the breast cancer group that individuals who were exposed to high doses of alkylating exposure, as was previously shown by uh, uh, Tara Henderson, as well as the Dutch group, uh, these individuals were at higher risk for developing breast cancers. We didn't see any other associations with chemotherapy exposures, either in this uh, disease group or in the others. I think it's important to point out, because when I think people think about subsequent cancers and chemotherapy exposure, you often think of uh, secondary or treatment-related leukemias or myelodysplasia. And within this group, we're only looking at malignancies occurring at five years or more after initial diagnosis, so we're losing a lot of that group here. So there are a few limitations to this study. I think our sample size precluded the more detailed investigation of specific chemotherapy agents that we were hoping to uh, be able to look at, as well as interactions between chemotherapy agents. We didn't have the data to look at genetic predisposition, which I think is going to be an incredibly interesting part of this particular analysis. And then we also don't account for radiation exposure from other sources, things like imaging studies, which we often downplay but can be significant, as well as radiation exposure that may have occurred for some of their other malignant neoplasms occurring beyond five years from treatment or from uh, initial cancer. So some of the conclusions from the more recent treatment era we know that cumulative incidence and risk for subsequent malignancies has decreased, partly due to reductions in treatment with radiation over time, and that among survivors who are treated with chemo and not radiation, high-dose alkylating agent and platinum exposure are associated with overall subsequent malignancy risk. We specifically identify that subsequent breast cancer was associated with high-dose anthracycline exposure in non-radiated survivors. And we know that despite a lot of great progress over time, all survivors remain at increased risk for subsequent malignancies compared to the general population. So why does this matter? We looked at a lot of cumulative incidence curves. We, the numbers seem probably fairly small, but this, this information and these data are really important to help inform the ways that we care for our survivors over time. So many of the articles cited here, including my own, have been cited in the long-term follow-up guidelines that the Children's Oncology Group has put together to help uh, manage our patients as they get to that five years out from diagnosis time point. So 
Our goal is to have all of our survivors coming back to the survivorship clinic on an annual basis, and then we can counsel them on appropriate surveillance guidelines and appropriate long-term follow-up. Um, and that, within our program, happens through our Childhood Cancer Survivor Program long-term follow-up clinic. Our goal, over, sort of overarching with all of this, is really not only to cure these kids, but to provide them the highest quality, long-term survival possible. So there's a lot coming, I think, in cancer therapies that are going to change the way that we think about long-term effects of therapy and things that are really unknown. So we've got cars, bikes, trikes, bikes, all sorts of new therapies, and no one really knows how those therapies are going to influence subsequent cancer risk or other late effects. So I think there's a lot of future directions in subsequent cancer research, for sure. So I think considerations for immunotherapy exposures are going to be incredibly important. The use of uh, GWAS data and the whole exome sequencing data that we've been working on in collaboration with the National Cancer Institute will help us better understand the role of genetic susceptibility along with treatment exposures in these secondary cancers. I think there's also the possibility of investigating a lot of host and biological features that may predispo predispose individuals to subsequent cancers, things like obesity, inflammation. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to enhance our collaborations with international cohorts to increase our power to identify other risk factors. Um, in terms of my next directions for my work, um, as I mentioned before, breast cancer is a huge issue for our survivor population, and very little is known beyond the risk factors for what happens. So we don't know necessarily how these women are treated for subsequent breast cancers. Their treatment is often limited because of their previous exposures to anthracyclines and radiation. Um, it's very difficult for providers to make appropriate decisions for these women. We also don't know how these women tolerate therapy, so they are going through chemotherapy for potentially a second time what are their treatment-related toxicities? Are they able to receive all of their prescribed therapy? Um, it's not been described. We also don't know what their survival looks like compared to women with primary breast cancers. And so I was recently awarded a KOA to study all of those questions and to get a better idea in this subsequent malignancy population of how we're treating these women, how they tolerate it, and, and how their survival compares to, to women uh, overall with breast cancer. So hopefully we'll have some additional work to share with everyone in the coming months. So as I said, I do talk pretty quickly. So I have plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. How do these data, or are there any surprises if you compare this cohort with, say, Hiroshima or Chernobyl or this sort of accident when the yeah. entire population get radiation. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think a lot of different radiation exposed individuals, the, a lot of the secondary thyroid cancer in particular has been in, in survivors from Hiroshima, and even individuals exposed to radiation for, I, mean, I think they used to treat like head lice with radiation, and they've seen these really interesting similarities in exposure with secondary breast, breast or, uh, secondary brain cancers, secondary thyroid cancers, in cancers, very similar. Um, how do the changes in radiation exposure or treatments in general relate to the effectiveness of treating these cancers? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So when we look at childhood cancer survival over time, I think that early slide that I was able to show that even with reducing our intensity of radiation exposure, but then increasing intensity of chemotherapy. For many of our childhood malignancies, we've seen really dramatic improvements in outcomes. Um, there certainly are those lagging behind some of our high-risk neuroblastomas, um, DIPGs, or certain type of brain cancers that we haven't been able to achieve those same results with. But overall, even with the reduced radiation, we've been able to maintain very good outcomes in children. See any mention of testicular cancer in these data? And um, yeah. aren't they a group that gets uh, radiation therapy sold? 
study is going Yeah, on. so that's a really great point. The childhood cancer survivor study did not include certain types of childhood malignancies like germ cell tumors, hepatoblastomas, retinoblastomas. So that's a big gap in what we're able to present. There certainly are a lot of very compelling data in testicular cancer survivors, um, specifically on late effects and subsequent malignancies. And so both in the radiation exposed as well as the chemotherapy only exposed, they were seeing associations in the testicular sur cancer survivors um, of higher rates of subsequent malignancies related to their platinum exposures, but then also related to their um, radiation exposure. Um, I assume the data also has um, outcomes related to cardiovascular toxicity, and do you find that chemotherapy is more relevant there than radiation? Or is it yeah, similar? I mean, I think there's definitely a combination effect. So there's a dose, um, kind of a dose response with the alkylating agent exposure, and then agent exposure matters, but then individuals who had both the alkylating age, or the, I'm sorry, anthracycline exposure plus radiation exposure have the highest risk of all. And so there are very comprehensive data on cardiac outcomes in this population. Any other questions or comments? They unfortunately are not able to question us right now because we are using a WebEx format. And um, I'm looking at Nick. He's not signaling me that there's any questions. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Well, thank you, Lucy. All right. Thank you very much.